This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 252, recorded on September 26th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today right here in the TWIV studio is Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. Good morning, Dixon. And good morning to you. We are recording at an unusual time. It's Thursday. It's 11 a.m. Right. And the weather is gorgeous here in New York. (laughs) Yes, it is. 19 degrees, partly cloudy. Yep. Right? Yep. And 71% humidity. How about that? How about that is right. Didn't feel like it. No. And you explained it to me before? I did. Well, because the air is cooler, even though the humidity might be high for that temperature, it's not high with regards to uncomfortableness. What a scientific explanation. (laughs) Wonderful. Because lower temperature airs hold fewer (laughs) amounts of, lot less water, let's just put it that way. Also joining us today from north central Florida is Rich Condit. Howdy, everybody. Good morning, Rich. Hello, Rich. Morning. Is Is it morning in Florida, too? Uh, yeah, it is morning in Florida, too. Yeah, we're in the same time zone. Right. And it is 76 degrees yes. and 90% Ooh. humidity. You see, that you would and, feel. That you and would feel. overcast. Right. Two Just, point is 73. It's a kind of a crummy day. Is it sticky? Uh, uh, well, I haven't been out there for a while, but yeah, it's sticky. Right. But, you know, if you live here, you don't notice it. <clears throat> Rich, the uh, your, your state was on the NPR this morning. Oh, is that right? Yeah, what do they, we do now? Well, they had a die-off of, of dolphins and manatee uh, at the mouth of Indian River. And oh, is that right? Yeah, and the, and the reason why they, they speculate is because the fauna and flora have changed because the runoff from Lake Okeechobee, which has you've received a lot of rain this year, uh, takes agricultural runoff and sewage from uh, 240,000 septic tanks right. and dumps it into that estuary and it, it, it elicits algal blooms and the algal blooms change the life forms and it's now changed to a toxic algae which is kind of a red color to it it's not the red tide it's something else but the manatees each eat about 50 pounds of that every day and wow. uh, you just lost about a hundred of them that's too bad it is Bummer. really sad I, it doesn't say why the dolphins died. Maybe more biliform virus or something. More billy viruses. More billy viruses. That's well, we have had a, a slug of rain this year after a long drought, so I can imagine there's a lot of accumulated junk that's washing up. Absolutely, washed absolutely. In fact, we're all in the same time zone, you know. Yeah. And uh, also joining us today in the same time zone from <laughs> right. Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Good to be here. Hey, Alan. It's uh, morning there as well. Yes, it is morning here as well, and it's, um, let's see, it's 61 Fahrenheit, 16 mm. Celsius, mm. and um, only 58% humidity here in the see overcast. That. See that? It's chilly there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's an autumn New England. You got leaves? Day. You got leaves turning yet? Uh, just barely a couple of them are starting to turn, and I, I hope they don't start uh, covering <laughs> up the, the ground too soon, because I just planted a new lawn. Ah. ah, so you want to enjoy it a little bit so, before it well, I, well, I wanted to have a chance to germinate and sprout, and you know, get a get a mowing or two uh, right, right. done before I have to mow the leaves in. Is uh, that related to your front loader? Has you... Yes, yes. The um, the mini loader, the mini loader was part of the whole nice. landscaping project. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hello, Kathy. It's gorgeous here too. It's sixty-eight degrees, twenty Celsius. Humidity, 55%. Cool. Just right, That's great. Lovely. Yeah. Not a cloud in the sky that I can see. Oh, really? Right. We've got clouds. But, it's full. Uh, it's it's full. full. And also, there have been common colds going around. I know you had one, Dixon. I did. My son had one. I caught the end. I caught it, but very mild. <laughs> Good for you. I know Rich Condit is, has something brewing in his throat. Uh, I am under siege. Under you siege. You feel badly? Uh, I do not feel good. Oh, I'm sorry. Is it uh, an upper yeah, I, or lower respiratory? Uh, 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 it is a an upper respiratory. Yeah, that was infection. mine too. Mine was and, that too. Uh, last night was was a challenge. You sound oh, good geez. though. Do I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. We, <laughs> good. We still know who you are. <laughs> good. Well, Rich and I were in a room last Sunday for an all day, and so was Kathy, with uh, someone who had a upper tract infection. Mm. Kathy, you're okay, right? 
I'm fine so far. Knock on wood. Yeah, it's not going to happen from from that experience by now. It's already been a week. I'm sure my daughter will be bringing it home from school shortly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, guess what? We're doing an all email episode. Cool. Hey, <laughs> too bad. That's a good idea. Should probably yeah. shift it over to rhinovirus, but I that's put, okay. I put on Tuesday all the email I had, and that's all on this agenda here. And then this morning I looked, and there were three or four more. So how many you got here? Have you I don't know. I didn't count them. This thing scrolls on forever. It goes on forever. I just, I don't think we'll get to all of them, but <laughs> let's start. I'll start with um, <clears throat> with the first one by Robin, who writes uh, a variety of things related to different episodes. First, do points sends us a link to uh, explain do points, right? Uh, which Dixon was trying to do, I suppose. I, I made a feeble attempt. Right now, the oldest rodent. Uh, I don't know. I think we were talking about that at some point. We uh, were. <clears throat> he sends a, a link to Rodent. She or he? Wikipedia. You're not no, sure No, it's he. I know it's he. You do? Okay. It's, he's got a picture associated oh, with I'm his sorry. emails. Sorry That's what it. happens on Gmail. Oh, okay. Him. Well, you know. <laughs> Evolution and history. The fossil record of rodent-like... This is about rodents. Of rodent-like mammals begins shortly after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs 65 million years ago, as early as the Paleocene. Some molecular clock data, however, suggest modern rodents, members of the order Rodentia, already appeared in the late Cretaceous, although other molecular divergence estimations are in agreement with the fossil record. By the end of the Eocene epoch, relatives of beavers, dormice, squirrels, and other groups appeared in the fossil record. Yep. All right, now moving on to human transferrin receptor evolution, he says. Mm -hmm. If viruses latched onto the active site, wouldn't they be killing the goose that laid their golden eggs? (laughs) Hence, no such geese are found because they die off quickly, perhaps a corollary to the anthropic principle. Dixon, do you know what the anthropic principle is? Nope. Yeah, I didn't either. He sends a link to it. There, there was a, there's a classic, uh, supposedly a piece of graffiti in a philosophy department somewhere. Somebody had written, uh, why is the universe here? And someone had written underneath it, where else would it be? <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, if, if um, remember, we talked about viruses that bind the transferrin receptor for cell entry, but they don't bind the active side of the, of the transferrin receptor. And if it makes sense because the cell mutates to avoid virus binding and would not do that. Well, actually, it's a good question. If the virus bound to the active site, the cell wouldn't be able to change it. Right. right? So why doesn't that happen? Mm. Remember, there are no why questions out there, just how. Well, I, was, I, I, I think the, <laughs> um, the killing the goose that laid the golden eggs principle here is if it binds to the active site of the transferrin receptor and inactivates... Oh, yeah, if it inactivated, that would not be good. Uh, but yeah. it would have to... It, I, I don't think that would necessarily be a problem unless you had enough virus particles to titrate the receptor, right? Mm. Well, if, yeah, I mm. doubt that would happen on a cell surface, right? right. Yeah, so you'd have... It would be okay to bind the active site... Is that, if, I guess that's what he's There's more than one binding site, that's right. Yeah, I mean, if, there, if there's more than one receptor on the surface... Sure. Odds are you're going to have just a few viral particles sticking to a few receptors, and that'll just be a little attrition of the receptors that the cell yeah. won't be yeah, affected. So I see. I wasn't looking. I was viewing it in terms of evolution and host virus conflict, right? No, I think the question is, um, is wouldn't binding the active site kill the yeah, cell right. surely? And, and I don't think that would be an issue because there are other receptor yeah. molecules on the surface in a normal infection. But well, it, the cell's going to be cooked anyway, right? It's getting infected. Right, infected. but the virus needs to get into the cell to infect it, and so if it if it wipes it out by binding the transferrin receptor, <laughs> right. um, then that's a, a premature mm-hmm. death. But I, I the other the other uh, way of interpreting this question is what you were going with, Vincent. Yeah, so if the virus did bind the active site, the cell could not counter it with mutations at the active site because it would inactivate the transfer. Right. So I don't know why that doesn't happen. Right. Uh, Rich, you and I are going to visit Sarah Sawyer's department in a couple of weeks. We'll ask her. <laughs> yeah, we got a bunch of questions queued up here. The one, one drawback of binding the active site, though, is that it's active. So it's, it's binding other stuff, and it's doing things and changing configuration. And uh, yeah. Might Maybe be, it's no room for the virus. Yeah. Might be too much of a yeah, yeah, my perception has always been, I mean, I'm mm. basing this mostly on the flu HA, but I think it uh, uh, relates to the transferrin receptor as well. And that, that is that the active site 
is uh, usually buried a little bit relative to the antigenic sites. I'm not sure that it's easy for the virus to get at it. I mean, I might even argue that some of the uh, antigenic sites have evolved to uh, be there as a distraction or something like that. Um, By the way, Dixon, yes. I was at a textbook meeting this week, and Mm-hmm. I said, you can't ask why questions. And they all said, yeah, you can. You just can't answer them. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. <laughs> yes. See, well, I get in trouble when I repeat what you tell me. No, but you really can't ask, you know, why is the sky blue? You can say, what makes the sky blue? But, you know, um, it's a philosophical question. Yeah, when you We're ask never going to get through these, I guess. <laughs> I guess no, you know, no, we never, no. why should we? <laughs> Asian human arena viruses are not found in spite of the variation in their transferrin receptor. Maybe the fossils are present in the genomes. I don't, maybe, I, I don't know if we have all the genome sequences to tell, but yeah, that was, I think, one of the suggestions in the paper. So we haven't said what the anthropic principle is. No, we haven't. Yeah. The what philosophical consideration that observations of the physical universe must be compatible with the conscious life <laughs> that observes it. Whoa. Uh, well, no, the, the idea right. is the why, why does the universe <laughs> allow life to exist? And the anthropic principle says um, if it didn't, we wouldn't be here to ask this question. That's crazy stuff. Yeah, it's so all only, kind only, of only a universe that allows the evolution of life can be regarded philosophically by that life. It's, hmm. Yeah, it's kind of circular for me. I, I am a I little agree. hung up on it, but I found another link that at least has an interesting example, and basically says it tackles the question, why is the universe itself just right for us, for life? So, All right. It's yeah, a self-fulfilling I'm prophecy. Trying Come to on. stretch my brain around what's the <laughs> anthropic principle, it's yeah. kind of hurting my brain. Uh, Robin continues, viral diseases of trees. Again, if viruses wiped out trees, then those trees wouldn't be around. The anthropic principle again. Also, a tree has much more internal autonomy of its parts than animals. If one part is killed off, other parts might survive. Beneficial mutations could be selected for within regions of the tree itself. Dixon may lo- no longer be a cash cow, but when it comes to information and ideas, he's a stud bull. Yeah, yeah. Who said you weren't a cash cow? Who said I wasn't a stud bull? <laughs> I, I think the cash cow meant it for the university. Yeah, he's I'm not, not bringing, uh, grants, bringing in overhead money and yeah. stuff like this, but stud bull, yeah. gee. Hey, three weeks in a row, Dixon. I, yeah, it's amazing. What's you, wrong? You choose to read these things, and you know, I'm sort of Are you embarrassed? Taking a little bit. All right. I'm not cutting it out. <laughs> Running backwards. It's because he, he provides such seminal comments. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, thank you, Alan. Alan. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He Run, said testily. <laughs> Run, oh, Dixon. <laughs> Let's not go there, please. Uh, running backward, as suggested to the USNMS. Yes, running backward right now would be a very good idea. <laughs> Officer in letters is actually a valid sport, and he provides a link to backward running. Why is there only one species of humans? The hominin lineage, the lineage leading to humans after divergence of the lineage leading to chimps and bonobos from the common hominid ancestor has had almost two dozen species, depending on whether one is a lumper or splitter. Even more recently, there's been many members qualifying for the genus Homo, Habilis erectus, Heidelbergensis, Neanderthalus, Dennis Sylvanus, and the Twiv team. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, cool, Homo Twiv. That's right. The last two extinct species have actually (laughs) been our contemporaries for most of our 200,000 years, but they did not display the rapid innovation and improvement in tools and implements that characterized us since our migration out of Africa about 50,000 years ago. Innovate or perish. Prior to more complete gene sequencing, the Neanderthal branch was studied on the basis of mitochondrial DNA and seemed to have no overlap with humans. Since mitochondrial DNA is matrilineally inherited, it means no Neanderthal ladies were imported into the human tribe. However, now that we know that some Neanderthal DNA was imported into our tribe, it would have right. been through our ladies. Here, here. Checking email functionality. One way to check if one e- one's email accounts are functional would be to send an email from one's Gmail to one's Yahoo or Hotmail or us.army.mil or the other the way around. <laughs> Good sense and this of humor. relates to my uh, pick of the week in Twitter uh, yeah. 242, which is the comic about, I'm not getting any email. Something must be wrong. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, do, uh, what does Robin do for money? I mean, <laughs> Robin is a retired <laughs> ER physician. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh-huh. He sounds like he should be part of the TWIF team. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you know? Right. 
All right. Um, Rich Condit, can you take DJs? DJ writes, Dear Vincent Racaniello and Twiv co-hosts, may I point to a section of your podcast group discussions on Twiv 242, I Want My MT- MMTV. <laughs> the dialogue I referred to sounded like a digression into political hysteresis and pseudoscientific proselytizing. Uh-oh. I focus on the discussion revolving on autism and vaccination. The listener was treated with an iconic and homonym attack on a celebrity whose apparent crime is apparently to have a disagreement with the scientific majority as it concerns the immunization slash vaccination controversies of the notable recent past. Acting as scientific authorities, a few TWIV members took turns publicly diminishing a celebrity named Jenny McCarthy. For example... We were told that she was a Playboy bunny and had other dubious uh, credentials prior to becoming a spokeswoman for requesting investigation on the link between autism and commonly administered immunizations slash vaccinations against certain disease-causing agents, especially in young children. While Ms. McCarthy's employment history may be a matter of public record, I see no justification to initiate what sounded like a verbal assault on her by front-loading information meant to diminish her activities concerning a controversial issue. This is a political tactic, if I'm not mistaken, certainly not a leading scientific approach when discussing research controversies, even when the public gets involved. Whatever the intentions of the podcast crew members may have been, this publicly offered discussion could have benefited from editorial excision prior to podcast. Rather than acting even-tempered and open-minded, certain members of the TWIV team seem to suggest that they found Ms. McCarthy to be at least a zealot, as this team as this term was used pejoratively to define a person who believes in something the majority find absurd. At least this was the interpretation I made while cringingly listening to the tirade against this woman and her opinions. While I will not weigh in on this controversy in this email, I will stand on scientific historical grounds by admonishing others for allowing emotions to rule over rational judgment. However, I will offer that whatever the scientific literature says on this subject, it will remain an open question whether the practice of sweeping vaccination slash immunization has an epigenetic effect on the human population. Finally, it comes as an unfortunate result that members of the scientific community make the decision to transition from hypothetical deductive experimentation to seemingly dogmatic hyperbole in the public domain. These are my personal opinions and do not necessarily reflect any other faculties of reason that I may or may not possess and or choose to articulate in this correspondence. It is not a controversial issue. Vaccines do not cause autism. Let's just uh, stop it right there. That's good enough. I mean, this... <coughs> I, 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 I feel I'm that... Said. Uh, wait, I'm not finished. <laughs> 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 I, I just feel that someone who is derided vaccination without any scientific basis uh, deserves to be ridiculed. Yes. I went back and listened to that segment, and I think Rich's background was solely presented in the scheme that Rich usually does, which is to give background. And it was straight off of Wikipedia, and you can see it on a search page without even clicking through. I don't think the information was meant to diminish her activities. It was just meant to describe how she got to her position as a celebrity. Oh, I'll diminish her activities. <laughs> this, is, this is somebody who has demonstrably harmed hundreds, if not thousands, of children as a result of advocating, uh, not requesting an investigation, as this writer seems to imply, but um, she advocates that there's a link between vaccines and autism and endorses all sorts of quackery and gives a platform to this this idiocy that has been so soundly disproven that it makes Piltdown Man look credible. I mean, this is this is absurd. She is an idiot, and she doesn't need to be given any airtime. And I think ABC's decision to give her additional exposure was a huge mistake. 
Okay. All right. That's not a political tirade. Right. That's just that's those are the facts. She's she has put herself out there as an advocate of an absurd position. I also think that zealot is an appropriate description. Entirely appropriate. Somebody who refuses to change a position based on overwhelming evidence. Yeah. I do agree that in general we should not in engage in personal attacks but no this is one example of where you're just doubting her scientific credibility that's yeah. all and you know, um, i don't care what her profession was or anything but she's not a scientist and has no right to convince people to do these things right, right. she's using her um, popularity as a foil for if there was such a thing as celebrity malpractice she would be guilty of mm. it yeah. this celebrity is this is using your powers for evil good way to put it i like that celebrity Good way to Malpractice. Put it. Good way to put it. All right, Alan, why don't you take the next one talking about... <laughs> sure. Oh, yes. Good one. Uh, Martin writes, quote, uh, The best data indicates that vaccine-induced chronic disease is now of a magnitude that dwarfs almost all prior poisoning of humans, including poisoning from agents like asbestos, low-dose radiation, lead, and even cigarettes. Most patients don't even realize that they are suffering from the adverse effects of vaccines. Even more concerning, patients and or their parents are being harassed, accused of practicing poor dieting and exercise habits leading to the development of, ob of obesity and diabetes when in fact they suffer from vaccine-induced obesity and diabetes, oh says J Dr. J. Bart Klassen. Malpractice. Um, yeah, so Dr. J. <sighs> Bart Klassen, I met him, uh, well, talked to him on the phone rather extensively way back in 1999, um, and uh, it was for a story for Nature Medicine. He was at that time testifying in front of a congressional subcommittee that um, one of these alternative medicine endorsers in Congress had put together. And Klassen built a company, Klassen Immunotherapies, whose business model relies entirely on patents uh, related to uh, that, that, assume, that presume that vaccines are unsafe. So this is somebody who, is, who has built a business around promoting anti-vaccination rhetoric, essentially. Um, it's a little bit convoluted, but he's, he's, that's where he's coming from. And this whole thing with uh, diabetes and obesity, I remember in the exchanges I had with him, he sent me these, these graphs that correlated vaccination rates with the rise of, of diabetes, and it's just absolutely absurd. You know, it's like those graphs that were a pick uh, a while right, back, right, you know, right. is this mountain range driving the murder rate? Um, <laughs> so it's just, it, he, he engages in this sort of thing in order to promote a business that's built on these um, these patents, and and he's done um, he's done a lot of uh, you know, recruiting influential politicians and taking things to the courts. I think they ended up in a in a suit with Myriad um, that okay. I last I heard was headed for the Supreme Court. May have gone to the Supreme Court, um, but they yeah this this is uh, this somebody this is somebody who's uh, in in the same department as Jenny McCarthy. Alan, this press release, that's what this is, is a press release it's a from press release, his company. Yes. It's, yes. It, but it's it's released by the Wall Street Journal. Why, yeah, that's really weird. Why is that? They... And they have a me, disclaimer. They say the journal was not involved in creation of this content, but why would they release it under their... It makes it um, validated in some sense, right? Yeah, so some news outlets in a desperate attempt to to keep their print business alive and, and go online have, have started um, aggregating information from press releases and releasing it as if they were wire stories. Wow. And the, the telltale sign for this, if you see at the top, uh, PR Newswire. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, not insulting PR Newswire. I subscribe to their feed. It's, it's an organization that publishes press releases online. Um, which is a fine service. You know, you can go there and, and look up press releases. The problem comes when people aggregate these and publish them in otherwise credible news outlets. Mm. And that's what's happening here. They're, they're essentially treating this as if it were an Associated Press or Reuters feed. Yeah, I think a lot of the anti-vax people latch on to that and say, look, the journal is publishing this. Of course, right. right. Absolutely anybody can publish anything on PR Newswire. You pay a fee and you send out your press release. Do we know anything about his background? Yeah, he just told you. 
No, I don't mean that. What is his, what is oh, his he's, uh, classification? He does, have, he does have a PhD in uh, biological sciences. I think, his, I think his brother is an MD who's helped him a little bit. Um, well, Bart Klassen is an MD. Bart Klassen's an MD, okay. That's what I meant to ask. Maybe um, the brothers. That, yeah, you can read about it in uh, um, Offit's book, right? Uh, yeah, I think Klassen comes up. Uh, if not, then certainly Offit covers this entire industry, and it is an industry built around drumming up public fear of vaccines. And there are various business models within that industry, but Klassen mm-hmm. is part of it. Do we know where you went to school? Well, you, I don't know offhand, no. I just want to say it relevant, and I wouldn't want to defame a fine institution if he went. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's enough for that one. Uh, I do want to state before we leave okay. unequivocally that everything that he says in that quote is false. Absolutely, yes. absolutely wrong. All wrong. Provably false. Uh, Peer reviewed literature shows it's false. That's right. Yeah. Kathy. David writes, Vincent, I've been listening to Twiv now for perhaps eight months. I've listened to the last 150 Twiv podcasts on my long commute. I really enjoy the show, and I've learned a lot from it. I'm a practicing pulmonary critical care doctor, so I have considerable interest in infectious disease. I was also impressed with the role of viral disease in my specialty when the H1N1 pandemic swept through my area. My podcast application uses feeds to organize and download podcasts. Now that I want to listen to the first 100 TWIVs, I'm stymied as I can't find a feed that includes them. I've noticed that some long-running podcasts have static archive feeds for the older shows so that the main feed doesn't get too long. For example, archives for 2008, 2009, etc. I think this would be a good addition to TWIV so that those who want to listen to the older shows can get ready, organized access to them. Keep up the good work. I think it's interesting to learn uh, how many physicians actually listen to us. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And yesterday on great. TWIP, that was also the case, Dixon, remember? I do. Uh, yes, uh, David, I will do that. I think it's a good idea. The The main feed for TWIV got too long, so we had to truncate it. And of course, all the shows are at TWIV.TV, but I right. will make feeds for yearly archives. That's a good idea. I will publish them at TWIV.TV. But it is important to note that if you go to the website, they're all there and you can download them. It's a little more... Right. I mean, yeah, they are online, but it's... Laborious, uh, but they're there. Yeah, I mean, if you want to just listen to them on a mobile device, it's it's easier to have them in a feed, right? Yeah. yeah. Dixon, are you up for reading an email? You betcha. It's from Robin again. Yep. No, it's like the different No, a different Robin. Robin. Yeah, different definitely. Robin. Yeah, for sure. That's right. Robin <laughs> writes, hey guys, first of all... I would like to, first of all, off, I would like to say I enjoy your podcast greatly and I want to thank you for putting them up. And then I just have a question on going into virology. So I'm 16 and I will be a junior in high school this upcoming school year. I was dead set on becoming a marine biologist until recently. And now I'm really into microbiology. It started freshman year in my biology class when my teacher showed us a movie on Ebola. I fell in love instantly, as terrible as that sounds. I was disgusted and awestruck. I wanted to know more. Then sophomore year, I made a game <clears throat> and wrote an essay about the Black Death for extra credit. I wanted to do my second semester extra credit assignment on Ebola, but sadly didn't have the time. And this summer, I started to read books about viruses and became extremely interested and started listening to your podcasts. As I'm getting closer to graduation and going into college, I was wondering what kind of classes I should take while I still can in high school. I'll be taking AP Biology, Physics, AP Calculus, AB, and uh, Honors English next uh, year, along with U.S. History and Orchestra. (laughs) This kid's really uh, ambitious. And what kinds of things should I be looking for in college, and what should I major in? I planned on going to school in my town, University of Alaska Fairbanks, because they have a great marine biology program, but they don't have microbiology. How can you have microbiology? That's okay. So I'm assuming that it isn't a good choice. Also, any other advice you could give me would be great. Thank you so much. And then he writes... No, uh, no. it's not him. So, oh, (laughs) really? That doesn't... It's us. It's us. Things things in brackets for us. (laughs) Got it, got it, got it, got it, got it. So I I just wanted to relate an anecdote. One of my (laughs) former graduate students told me that he had wanted to be a marine biologist. (laughs) And for a variety of reasons, he ended up not doing that. One of them was 
that his parents went to SeaWorld and struck up a conversation with their usher in one of the show auditoriums. And the usher said, oh, yeah, I majored in marine biology, and here's where I am. Oh, so um, that was not <laughs> impressive. But um, I did a little searching at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. There is a biology and wildlife department, um, and they do describe some biomedical studies. And there's at least one microbiology class that's taught there. I think he should, he or she uh, should talk to the high school guidance counselor or biology teacher to see if there are other places in Alaska. And the next closest place might be a larger institution with strong microbiology, uh, might be UBC in Vancouver or University of Washington. Um, you know, the larger research institutions are probably going to have more microbiology course offerings, but right. a strong background in biology with one course in microbiology might be enough to get you going. That's what I had. So, you, But it might be better if he or she went to UBC or UW, right? Uh, it could be. Um, you know, it just depends on the, the strength of the microbiology uh, class, I suppose, and, yeah. the, and the biology program itself. I mean, I think a good, solid undergraduate biology degree and one microbiology class might be enough, yeah. along with, at this point, he can listen to, he or she can listen to TWIV, TWIP, TWIM, look at your Coursera course, etc. Yep. You know, so. Yeah, I was, a, I was a general biology major. Yeah, I was you know, in a, in so a, was in a brand In a brand new school. That had when I when I joined there were only twelve hundred kids there. Oh, okay, wow. and you know I as a matter of fact I took a lot of botany, a lot of uh, development mm. and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff and right. and you know I just well there were requirements but beyond that I just took stuff that I was interested in. I'd actually recommend mm. not narrowing it down too much at the undergraduate level because um, it's it's beneficial to have a more general biology. Background. I think I'm partly I'm biased because I had that like <laughs> everybody else here. Um, right. But uh, you know, I I was a general biology major and I minored in chemistry. Um, decided I really liked chemistry toward the end, but it was too late to double major. Right. And, and but you know, you're 16. You you may decide that you want to do something else. Um, and even if you don't, if you're going to go into microbiology, the the one one undergraduate one good undergraduate course in it is plenty. Mm -hmm. uh, you're yeah, going to need chemistry, organic chemistry. Um, you're going to need uh, a little more, not a whole lot more math if you're already taking calculus. But um, general biology stuff is extremely useful. Um, you know, right now a lot of what's going on in microbiology, especially with things like microbiome studies is involving ecological concepts that were developed originally in wildlife biology. Good point. And botany. So, you know, those courses will not be useless. In fact, they'll be, they'll be very, very useful perspective if you do stick with microbiology. Yeah, but I also think, uh, I also think at the undergraduate level, if you're looking for a career in uh, uh, science, in particular biological science, some, some exposure to uh, statistics uh, yes. or... You know, related field is important, and I'll beat my biochemistry drum again. I think biochemistry, and I never really had a, a a really thorough, good, solid biochemistry course. I've had to kind of pick it up along the way, and I think I think that's the language that we speak. I think that's really important. Mm. I wish I'd taken more statistics. Oh man, yeah. so important yeah. now. Math. Yeah. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know anything yeah. about math. There's another thing though <laughs> to talk about, and that is the summers in between. Uh, you yes. Know, for a second, there, you can get a job working mm -hmm. in a microbiology lab someplace, mm -hmm. you know, in a, a research uh, institution or a hospital or something like that to get an idea of what the life of a microbiologist is really like, and especially in the virology group, uh, they welcome people like uh, like high school students, sometimes or college students, uh, but if the opportunities are not there, which raises the issue of being in a small place rather than a larger place, then the choices are less. So. Uh, maybe uh, University of Washington is a good suggestion, or, or British Columbia, because because yeah. the opportunities to get to know microbiologists are, are greater in that uh, setting. Yeah, right now for next summer. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So my college roommate, Tom Weingartner, is a professor of physical oceanography at UAF. 
And so I'm going to send him your email, Rob. Oh, cool. And you could hook up with him and get some advice and find Excellent. out what other kinds of courses there are. There. That is a wow, great that's idea. nice. That's great. I Excellent. Could, Perfect. Could, uh, he does cool stuff. <laughs> there you go. He is, he is always out on boats. He tells oh, yeah. me about it, and he's got to raise money for these boats. He's got yeah. to arrange everything. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. So what's his discipline? So he is interested in salinity and heat and salt fluxes, and he tells me in the top centimeter of the ocean. <laughs> I mean, he's interested in the grand uh, conveyor belt then, perhaps. Yeah. He, uh, he's been doing a 28-year time series of temperature and salinity variability in the Gulf of Alaska. Right. The goal is oh, to quantify this variability and determine its causes. Mm. But some of the cool things he does, he's also interested in tides, and he says many power companies are interested in putting uh, yes, turbines underwater where the tides go and That's generating true. electricity. So That's he true. helps them with that, too. Nice. So anyway, we'll Neat. hook you guys cool. up. It's very cool. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Shelby writes about episode 198. I don't remember what that was. I have no virology background, but have gained so much information and understanding, I hope, from listening to your podcast. As you can see, I'm still working my way through back episodes, but I do really enjoy it. Thanks. Shelby's from Indianapolis, Indiana. P.S. I always listen till the end of the episodes, which prompted this email. <laughs> Thank you. I just- 198 was the uh, pox has got a squeeze box. Seals are going to no. sneeze all night. That was a good episode. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I wonder saying. who came up with that one. <laughs> Alan. Alan was on yeah, the no, show. Yeah, no, 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 no. We, 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 we. <laughs> Rich, you are up next. Robin writes, uh, TWIV vaccines. Attempting to mobilize the immune system against HIV in conven- conventional ways is offering them lunch meat. <laughs> Trying some kind of an evolutionary end run might be more interesting, particularly so since... We have to live in interesting times. Um, A starting point may be the comparing of retrovirus fossils to their extant kin with a view to seeking some insight into the ways in which they are accommodated by their hosts. Would a fossilized HIV work? If it would, how could it be incorporated into the human germ cell line? Hmm. I don't know if it's... It's probably too distantly related to be of any use, Mm -hmm. these fossilized retroviruses. Mm -hmm. A new paper just came out recently, very, very exciting, which is getting everyone exciting from uh, Oregon. It's called Immune Clearance of Highly Pathogenic SIV. And this was a vaccine approach uh, which prevented, it cleared virus from these monkeys. I think we'll do this at some point in the future. Uh, and that seems to be a, a reasonably conventional approach that has mm. some details that's making it work. Mm. Mm. Alan, can you take Joe's? Uh, Joe writes, Kathy et al. <laughs> hey! <laughs> I had to laugh at Vince's digression into the food value of placentas since I had recently listened to two episodes on the Moth podcast in which a father agonizes over the politically correct answer to what to do with this emotionally charged organ. (laughs) Not much biology involved, but very funny and worth a listen. Um, As always, love the show. Warmest regards, Joe. Uh, So, yeah, this is a... um, uh, I I haven't listened to this yet, but it it looks promising. I listened to... I listened to... uh, They're called... One is called Sex on Ice, and the other is called The Placenta Monologue. (laughs) uh, (laughs) I I listened to one and a half of these, and they're pretty good. Uh, I hope it struck a good chord with you. Oh, good. Thanks. Oh, Dixon. (laughs) Nice. Um, Kathy, There there was room for one more pun. (laughs) Kathy. Uh, Robert writes, I've just finished listening to episode 245, and I decided I needed to let you know how much I enjoyed it. I'm a retired Ph.D. biochemist slash immunologist, and I finished my doctorate in 1975. I met my wife at UCLA while I was a postdoc, and my best man at our wedding was Marty Hewlett, who was a postdoctoral student in David Baltimore's lab beginning in 1974 to 1977. Marty and I were graduate students together at the University of Arizona College of Medicine Department of Biochemistry in Tucson. 
Mm-hmm. Marty returned to the University of Arizona and continued to do research on a number of different topics in virology. I spent eight years at UCLA as a faculty member in the Department of Neurology, where I did research in MS and human immune regulation in autoimmune diseases. I left academia and spent the rest of my career in industry. I had to smile during the discussion about Luria's text as I could see my copy of the book on the bookshelf next to my desk, Mm -hmm. although it is a later edition with Baltimore, Darnell, and Campbell as co-authors. I just purchased the latest edition of Principles of Virology, and I'm looking forward to reading it as I am also taking the Coursera Virology course. I agree completely with the philosophy of teaching virology from principles rather than on a virus-by-virus basis. I'm glad to hear that the next version of your book will include an electronic version. Thanks again for taking the time to do the TWIF podcast. Yours truly, Robert. So 245 was our episode about writing uh, the textbook right. that he's referring to. And I, I wanted to mention here, um, I actually found a copy of the original Luria uh, general virology textbook online. A free PDF. It's the 1953 version. You can get it as a PDF, an EPUB, a Kindle, a Daisy, full text. And I'm going to put the link in the show notes because you guys should look at this. Oh. It's so cool to read this book. I'm going to paste it in right here. <laughs> I was in the show notes for that episode. But it's free. Someone scanned it and put it up there, and it's cool. totally legit. Wow. And you read this, and it's really – it's just great to read. 1953. <laughs> right? Of course, everyone knows the year I was born. <laughs> uh, Dixon, I believe. Yes, here you we are. Go. Up with this is a very long one, Dixon. I'm going to give it my best. Okay. Renato writes, "Hi, Twiv. I'm sure you heard the news. The NIH and the Lax family reached an agreement about how to proceed regarding the HeLa genome. Some links, and he lists a bunch of links. You're not going to read them, Dixon. You want me to read? No, them? I'm just no. Kidding. happy to read them, but I think we can list them instead." The NIH director's blog uh, has the more concise summary I've found. Quotes: We have uh, agreed that the that NIH-supported uh, researchers will deposit any DNA sequences derived from HeLa cells into NIH's database GAP database or DB GAP database, and have established a process through which researchers can request controlled access to that data. Such requests will be reviewed by a working group consisting of physicians, scientists, a bioethicist, and two members of the Lax family. If you uh, take some time to drill these pages for, for their links, you will find some documents defining the working group, the general rules for requesting access to the databases, and the special instructions, which seem more, the more interesting ones, and then he lists one. There are a couple of things in these instructions which I think are noteworthy, especially if this agreement ends uh, being used, especially if this agreement ends being used as precedent in the future. Hmm, that didn't make sense. Ends up being used. No, <clears throat> oh, ends up being used. Oh, you see, I didn't put that in there. I transcribed some excerpts below. Studies of ancestry or population origins are not permitted. Uh, you want me to read all those quotes? Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, the researchers must agree to state whether the research is intended or could be reasonably expected to result in a patent or commercial product or service. Researchers must agree to respect the privacy of the family members of Henrietta Lacks by not attempting to contact them. Researchers must agree to recognize the contribution of Henrietta Lacks, including an acknowledgement when reporting or presenting scientific findings based on the HeLa genome data. Finally, the item approved process says that the working group reports their condition Conclusions to the ACD and the ACD makes the recommendations to the NIH director. Googling NIH ACD indicates ACD means advisory committee to the director. I find these rules quite reasonable, but I'm not a researcher trying to get funded by NIH. What do you think? Almost forgot. Weather in Sao Paulo is mild, ranging from 13 to 28 degrees C. We haven't had rain for a couple of weeks, so humidity is very low and pollution is high. Beautiful heavy metal sunsets. <laughs> Cheers, <laughs> Renato. <Nice. laughs> I like that. Yep. Heavy metal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, most of, I mean, we've talked about this before on two, what was it? Two, two, seven, right? Mm-hmm. And we gave our opinions. I mean, most of these are pretty harmless, but. Um, the most important thing is getting past this advisory committee. and I just, I just think that's an impediment to uh, spontaneous science. But this is a special case. This is not meant to be a framework for future uh, studies. They're going to have to do that all differently. This is a special case to 
you know, make the family feel better about their ancestry and so forth. Sure. Now, this, well, is a spe- this is a special case in particular because uh, Henrietta lacks, uh, you know, uh, her name ancestry is already out there yeah. associated right. with this uh, with this genome. Exactly. Yeah. If if people develop good ways to protect anonymity, then then a lot of these concerns will go away. But that's still. Yeah. An active area of, of research. Yeah, I, I recently heard some blurb on a news show that said that uh, Henrietta Lacks's genome has now been um, so altered by trans transforming these cells and and using them again and again and again that now they have so many other chromosomes in them that they no longer are Henrietta Lacks and therefore you don't have to call them that any longer. I don't know how you guys feel about that because I don't I don't use those cells. We but talked about that on two twenty seven. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's. <laughs> This doesn't address that issue. Well, they're clearly very different, as, as evidenced by the fact that I have, in the lab over the last six months, tried six or seven or eight different HeLa lines, and they're all different with respect to virus See? susceptibility, at least the viruses we're testing. Sure. And many have argued that these are unrecognizable as Henrietta Lacks's genome. But the point is that it the family came from there. <laughs> wants to have this protected, and the sure. NIH is, is is acceding to their demands, and right. that's right. really what it is. Right, right. Uh, and these these requirements that he's quoted here are really pretty lightweight. Yeah, the ones that's, he that, that's perfectly yeah. fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the the variation in the uh, HeLa cell genomes. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that they're not recognizable with things that would be found in other lax family members. You know, there's duplications, there's deletions, potentially insertions as well, but there's still going to be some of it that's held in common with the with the lax family. Right. For now. Yeah. All right, the next one's from David who writes uh, my family was recently hit by a gastrointestinal illness that I think was norovirus. We visited relatives who had just had an acute gastrointestinal illness with prominent vomiting three or four... By the way, any listeners who are eating while listening to this podcast, you might want to pause for just this letter. Continue, Vincent. Three or four of our relatives developed vomiting, which subsided after about 24 hours. After one day of intense contact, our six-year-old developed vomiting all evening, and then two days later, our 11-year-old developed vomiting illness, too. I am a 45-year-old man, had rumbly, oh, I, a 45-year-old man, had rumbly tummy, medical term borborygmy, 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 and felt feverish at the same time that the six-year-old had his vomiting, but had no major manifestations of gastrointestinal illness, no vomiting, no diarrhea. Overall, it seemed like a norovirus outbreak. I had some immunity, but my children didn't have enough to stave off illness. During episodes of cleaning up vomit, this led me to have endless ruminations about norovirus and perhaps one interesting insight. Norovirus is incredibly contagious. One spews, what, 10 to the 11th particles per mil in vomit? As little as five particles are infectious. These, there are many serotypes, and immunity is waning after months. Then why aren't we always infected almost continuously? A theory. The virus is persistent in the environment. CDC states how hard it is to eradicate it. They recommend steam treatment of textiles and chlorine treatment of hard surfaces. In practice, very few virus particles are destroyed this way. Maybe the reason that people have long-term resistance to any given serotype is exactly this persistence. After an acute infection, where someone in the family spews virus everywhere, it persists, but everyone in the environment develops short-term immunity. This immunity is then reinforced every time one ingests a few virus particles from the environment. Hence, a laboratory one-time exposure results in short-lived immunity, but in the real world, an infection leads to constant immune enhancement until the final viral particle decays in the environment. This theory could be developed into experiments. That is, do organisms sustain immunity with repeated low-level exposure? If so, what does this imply about disease control? Perhaps the best vaccine for such a virus is to apply an attenuated multivalent virus to people continuously, say, every year at a doctor's visit. Or even better, spray this multivalent attenuated virus around the home so everyone picks up some virus particles over the next 12 months and hence maintains constant immune surveillance for the virus. If not the home, how about the doctor's waiting room? This strategy, it's already being done. <laughs> this strategy, <laughs> this strategy might not be popular among the anti-vaccine woo-woos, but I'm doing theoretical <laughs> science here. If this theory is true, it implies that the virus is playing off the low chance of infecting a previously infected host 
with the chance of infecting a new naive host. Doesn't this have implications for disease control? What thoughts have you, O oh virus gurus? I've had this bug in the past and I grow weary of it. It kills few, though I've seen at least one critically ill patient who started with it, but it makes many miserable. I'd like to take advantage of its evolutionary strategy to defeat it. Mm. Well, um, <clears throat> I, I, from what I understand from listening to the neurovirologists, the key here uh, is or the people who have recently had infection and are shedding, and they're working and spreading the virus food handlers, for example, and so forth. I, I, I don't hear them talking about persistence of the virus in the environment, or, because if it really did that in a home, say, you would be infected sure. quite often. Right. So right. Uh, I don't I, – my feeling is, and we really should run by this, Stephanie and Christiana, uh, my feeling is that it's the uh, shedders that's really – that are really responsible. Mm -hmm. The general principle that he's talking about here, though, the notion of being uh, constantly boosted uh, uh, in, by uh, with subclinical infections of some organism or another is not uh, is not out of the question. And I think there are yeah, documented right. examples of that kind of tons. Thing. It's of an it. interesting idea, but it, but not just for virology, but you know, in parasitic diseases like malaria and schistosomiasis, there are very very well documented. Uh, epidemiologic curves for acquisition of acute infection versus chronic infection versus no infection whatsoever because you're totally immune at that point. Like, um, yeah. So there is a constant exposure rate for people who survive past the age of five, let's say, for malaria, and by the time they get into their 20s, malaria is just a mild infection every year. The same is true for schistosomiasis. When you wade in water every day or every year, uh, eventually, when you reach your 20s, you stop accumulating worms, and by the 40s, you are eliminating them with your immune system. And by the 60s, if you live that long, you're uh, free of the infection altogether. And you don't acquire it anymore because you've uh, been uh, uh, infected with the uh, penetrating stage in your skin all, all the time, all year. So th those are good examples of uh, non-virological infections which uh, require... Um, constant reinforcement of the immune system in order to uh, result in a sterile immunity. Yeah, I'm thinking of uh, uh, the case with either <coughs> measles or mumps or both, I forget, and I hope I'm remembering this correctly, where uh, the vaccination uh, programs have reduced the uh, incidence of those diseases down to a very low level, but in the recent uh, a uh, few years, we've seen spikes of, you know, sort of small epidemics of disease uh, that that weren't there after the after the disease uh, was was first uh, brought under control. And uh, I think I'm recalling correctly that one theory. Now, this is a theory as to why that might be. Is that through the vaccination program, we've eliminated uh, or reduced the uh, load of wild type virus in the in the environment to the point where people are no longer getting boosted on a regular basis mm -hmm. with what would be a subclinical infection, uh, and and so we are e even more naive than we were when the virus was circulating. Yeah, you know the problem with that is that there are these island populations where mm -hmm. you have a measles outbreak and then there's no measles for sixty years. And, well, this was in the 1800s, the uh, Faroe Islands. I'm thinking uh -huh. uh, right. without. Boosting, yeah. so I don't know if you really need that. Right. So right. anyway, yeah, and also you have to. Um, uh, I mean, it, going back to to Dave's point of using this as a as a vaccination strategy, if for some viruses that might be a viable approach if you can get people to spray a uh, virus around their house, but um, but for others, the risk of this. Uh, the downside of this ongoing environmental uh, boosting that might normally occur is um, is a horrific burden of disease. Yeah. Right. I, I, you know, it raises the question about pediatricians. Then, do they get fewer colds because they're always exposed to them through their patients? Oh, they get plenty of colds. <laughs> I know they do. So that's <laughs> probably not going to work out too well. In that yeah. One. Yeah. It's. Um, I, I mean, the issue is you'd rather prevent these things entirely with a one shot deal. Um, well, sure. I, th I think you cannot have uncontrolled immunization. That's no. yeah. the problem. You, you can get right? tolerance right. this way too, right? You can actually. I've just uh, emailed Maybe. this this letter to Christiana, so 
I'll check at the end of Twib yeah. to see if she... Uh, okay, I will do the same thing. I'll send it to Stephanie, see who <coughs> who comes through. And the next one we'll is yours. competition Next here. one is yours, Rich. Ah, oh, I got it. Oh, man. Can't do two Honestly, things now. Detail. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, I want to comfort Dave by saying now he's an MD, so he probably has some familiarity with this. But I must say, the situation that he describes is very familiar to me. When my kids were small... Uh, and now that the kids have grown up, and uh, I think even before they left, but in particular after they left, and I have less exposure to these uh, young individuals, uh, I haven't had a uh, bout of neurovirus for quite a while. <laughs> right. Knock on wood. Uh, uh, yes, knock on wood. That's exactly right. <laughs> or do something Judson, else on wood. <laughs> Judson writes, Twiv folks, this was originally posted to Vincent's Virology Coursera forum, but after a week or so, I figured I'd send it out to Twiv as well. <laughs> First of all, congratulations to Vincent on the ASV news. That is, uh, Vincent is our president-elect. Also, of course, I'm not a virologist. I just recently got into TWIV on the advice of a friend who is, so I apologize in advance if this question is known or obvious. In TWIV 243, if I understood correctly, Christiana talked about how difficult it was to get norovirus to infect human cells and how the immunity to norovirus fades in 6 to 12 months. However, I didn't hear or may have missed any discussion about how the virus interacts with the human microbiome. Hmm. So, my question, is it possible that norovirus co-infects or even primarily infects the gut microbial cells instead of focusing on human cells? That might explain the fading immunity over a year, since I could imagine that the human microbiome population would turn over fairly quickly. Also, uh, that also might help explain why different people are immune to different strains of norovirus, since the microbiome varies so much from person to person. Uh, on a more general level, even if I'm way off base with norovirus, are there other viruses that are zoonotic from bacteria or protozoa? I assume that must uh, be a very different jump due to the large difference in host genotype. But given the sheer numbers and statistics, I could imagine that might happen. Thanks very much, Judson. So uh, I don't uh, know of any examples of uh, a virus jumping from a uh, one kingdom to another. Yep. Okay, And I would not imagine that mammalian viruses would actually infect the uh, gut uh, microbiota. However, uh, I think the idea that there is a microbiome uh, component to the norovirus infectivity is not uh, a bad idea at all. Could very well be, and that uh, um, uh, that needs to be taken into account in. Uh, figuring out how to culture the virus. I think someone, fact, uh, go ahead. I was going to say the same thing. Vincent. I think someone did ask that. Yeah. And um, I, I and my former student were a little bit surprised because we knew that um, Tien's rotation project in Christiana's lab had been something of uh, looking at the microbiome with respect to norovirus infection. So I think mm. uh, it's early days, but there's definitely interest in considering how viruses and the microbiome may interact. And we've talked about Julie Pfeiffer's work and Tatyana Golovkin's work um, in the past. So uh, Judson's definitely on the right track, that there may be something involved, but not uh, a trans-kingdom uh, infection kind of thing. That was the I one think, audience also, question, right? That was the one audience question from... I think so, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think this also underscores the general phenomenon that we see in the TWIV letters where questions that are preceded by something like this seems like a silly question are usually really, really insightful. That's yeah. right. That's right. Exactly. Because, <laughs> yeah, this, this, um, That's right. not a, tra again, a not, tra not a, you know, uh, this thing's not a phage, but, um, but something to do with the microbiota is a, a really good track to look into when you see this kind of variability, I think. Uh, you want to finish off with the weather there, Rich? Oh, was there weather on this? Yes, there Hang was. On. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. P.S. 
The weather here in downstate New York is currently 69 Fahrenheit, 21C, partly cloudy, with a dew point of 64 Fahrenheit, 18C. Nice. Uh, we got him into the dew point. That's good. Alan, Amazing. You, Amazing. Alan, you are next. Daniel writes, greetings. I know this was a brief aside in the show, but I was nevertheless disturbed by Vincent's comment calling Prius vehicles a fraud in episode 242. The comment sounds like a dive into the typical counterfactual misinformation about hybrid and electric technologies. It dismays me to hear such a swing from rebutting anti-vaccine claims down to bashing some of the better vehicles available in terms of multiple (laughs) environmental concerns. Too much of the automotive industry wants to maintain the status quo and simply produce outdated, inefficient, and dangerously polluting vehicles. This kind of attack usually seems to be based on misinformation from their old PR campaigns attempting to avoid criticism of their reticence to innovate. (laughs) Perhaps I misunderstand and you're coming from an entirely different direction, but that hasn't been my experience with such comments around the Internet and other media. Nothing warranting the descriptor fraud has ever turned up in my research into this or similar vehicles, though it has for many other types of vehicles, such as a lot of the vehicles using nothing more than hyped-up traditional technologies, which supposedly produce efficiency but are basically a step backwards, diesel and some alternative fuels which sacrifice emissions to obtain efficiency, and weak hybrid vehicles which provide almost no benefit other than to PR. I know this is off topic for your show and probably not uh, not of much importance to you, but please clarify when, when broaching <clears throat> such topics or look into this further before saying something so strong that appears to align with common green bashing or green washing misinformation. <laughs> and Daniel uh, signs as a Nissan Leaf and Toyota Prius owner. So I've always uh, chided Dixon about his Prius as it being a fraud in terms of this is not a environmentally sustainable model the batteries that are produced for these cars if you looked into the history of their production and disposal you would be appalled so this is great for the moment but it is not the model for the future it's a step in the right direction that's why i and i use fraud between dixon and i because he's (laughs) He's just uh, my buddy and i can tease him that's right i think that we have to figure out how to make and dispose of the batteries in a better way because if everyone had a battery driven car at this moment we'd have big problems Would i think dis- what we need to figure out is a better solution than cars correct because the fundamental <laughs> problem is that it, it takes a lot of <clears throat> yeah, I would agree. to move a ton of metal down the road just to transport one person from place to place uh, what's the alternative to a car? Like a bus, you mean? Or Probably mass transit. Yeah, there there Probably are practical mass sure. transit systems that could be sure. built that just aren't in most oh, places. Oh, man, that's really expensive, right? Well, it's expensive initially, but then the long-term I benefit know. is massive. Right, China you is know, finding you, this out right now, by the way. Exactly. If you look at, <clears throat> at developing countries that have these incredibly gridlocked traffic patterns and they're realizing that they need to build out more of their mass transit, or you look at Europe, which, unlike the U.S., did not destroy its mass transit system during, you know, the the 1940s. Yeah. Um, you oh. go there, and car ownership is not necessary to get from place. What to do place. you do though for really rural areas, though? Oh, fine, right? fine. If you need if you need to get out into the sticks, You're then right. I'm not saying ban cars. Yeah, like where you are, right? Yeah, if, you need to get, if you're going out to Western Massachusetts, that's yeah, right. That's right. Okay, but drive. even but, but. Uh, um, Alan, even here, I sometimes take the train, right? Sure. I get to the station. I got to get my car and drive home because I'm five miles away. Yeah, right? but that's five miles as opposed to. All uh, right, so you don't want to ban cars. You just want to get better mass transit. Exactly. Okay. So, so you'd have sure. you know, and, and then you can do things like lighter weight electric cars or or any zip other cars. kind of car. And if you're cars. only driving at five miles each way, that's not a big deal as opposed right. to commuting one person per vehicle across the George Washington Bridge. Yeah, you have to be efficient. Uh, you know, I just uh, at the risk of. Of people getting mad, I just love to have an eight-cylinder car making a lot of noise with a six-speed on the highway. I get that. You're not I alone. Totally, you are I not totally, alone. Totally get that. <clears throat> Meanwhile, but. his favorite automobile mass producer, BMW, has just come out with the uh, the eight E eight. I think it is. It's an electric car. All electric. So, what what kind of car do you drive? Then? I have a, a, a BMW 328xi, which is a six-speed manual, and it has a uh, uh, I think it has a six cylinder, the the typical inline six that BMW yeah, mastered. That's, it's, that's the same car my my wife drives. So I figure I have one more compression uh, <laughs> engine car. I really love driving. I love shifting. I love getting out on the highway with nobody around and I driving. totally get that. You know? But 
that's that's a recreational activity. That's true. Yeah, I, I agree. And again, I'm not talking about banning that. You know, go ahead on the weekend, go get to get out your BMW, get out your sure. whatever, and and go out to the rural roads somewhere and enjoy the heck out of it. But for a commute. You're not on an open highway. You're sitting right. in traffic, idling. Yeah, I, I, listen, I take the train as much as I can. It takes right. way longer for me to get here. It took me two and a half hours last week, door to door, taking the train. That's a lot of time. I can, this morning it was 50 minutes without traffic. Right. So it's a problem. But look, the, the, the issue is the battery, their production and disposal is really an issue. Look into sure. it and you will see it. Uh, I didn't mean to insult you, Dixon. I'm really sorry. You You're not a fraud. You did it's not just your car. That's <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, only I'm, in the context of Dixon. I'm, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, <laughs> add transporters. Hey, yes. Kathy, do you have an electric car? I do not. You're, I don't drive enough miles to justify even turning in the car that I have. So you, so you do have a car, though, right? <laughs> do have a car. Most of the time you ride a bike or you walk, right? Yep. I'd yeah. love to be able to do that. Yeah. Oh, well. Um, I have the Twivmobile. You've been in that. Day. <laughs> yeah, the Twivmobile is great. Uh, it's going to be twenty in July. Oh, who wow. read this? Who read this email? I forgot. Dixon. Uh, I think no. I read this. So Kathy is next. Okay, Joe writes. <laughs> Could the diabetes epidemic be caused by a virus, or is that just lazy thinking? It's 75 degrees with 45% humidity in Seattle, as I pose the question to the experts. And he gives a link to a blog. Type 2 is drinking uh, It's something evidently that has been discussed on Futures in Biotech, episode 93. Vincent, you put in that link. Mark. Yeah, so this is a that. very interesting this is a blog post about an interesting paper by Mike Snyder, who's a geneticist at Stanford. And what he did was to. Um, for a year, he collected his own samples from himself. Uh, he did his whole genome, and then he did metabolomics and proteomics for a year. And he made this interesting observation that he got two consecutive um, upper respiratory tract viral infections, a rhino and then respiratory syncytial infection, and they apparently triggered in him uh, type 2 diabetes. He had never had any diabetic episodes before that, but at that point he became diabetic he had to change his lifestyle. So, you know, that's that's an observation. It's an association. Very curious. And so this columnist asks, you know, can viruses cause type 2 diabetes? So I think we can't tell anything from Mike Snyder, his episode. We did this. Uh, Mark Pelletier, our buddy over on Futures and Biotech, had Mike on and talked about it. So we'll, I'll put a link to that episode in the show yeah, notes. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the virus triggered the type yeah. 2 diabetes. I would say he developed type 2 diabetes while it do, at the same time he was doing it. yes, that's right. Is he got the other risk factors for type 2? He didn't have any of them, interesting. None. Very interesting, yeah. And if he hadn't done this study, he wouldn't... Yeah, know. that's right. So um, type 1 has been thought to have a viral trigger for many years. You know, the idea that a virus right. could replicate in beta cells of the pancreas and right, destroy right. them, you'd become right. diabetic. That's right. And I'm going to put a link to a review article on that. It's just been really hard to prove. Yeah. You know, and it may be that well, a number of virus, in particular that some of the picornas, the coxsackie, have been associated with it. And we know in mice, you can infect mice with coxsackie viruses, and it will replicate in the, the beta cells and cause diabetes in mice. But we're just not sure about people. What were you going to say, Dixon? I was just going to say the other hypothesis that followed up on what you just said, an earlier one, that is you've encountered a viral infection during your childhood, and then the virus goes away, but the antigenic epitope resembles the uh, beta oh, yeah. cells, and you uh, turn it immune. into an autoimmune yeah. disease. And That's been proposed also. Yeah. yeah and I mean, my, I don't know much about <coughs> diabetes at all, but uh, I, my understanding of the type 2 uh, diabetes which is the more common, is that it's really associated with obesity and, and, that, and that. Correct. And right. it's an older person disease, and it's not an insulin deficiency. It's a secretion. So, I don't know. Effect. I just don't know, Joe. I thought the earlier diabetic uh, story, though, was backed up by the fact that uh, you, you, if it was a viral infection of the beta cells and it killed all the beta cells, you could re-transplant that patient with new beta cells and you'd be all right. But if you don't immunosuppress, they'll kill off the beta cells again with the antibodies that they thought attacked it to begin with. I think so. part of the problem is that the virus comes, does its destruction, and then sometime later you develop Yeah, diabetes, exactly. And you exactly. don't know exactly. Right, right. the cause. Right. Yeah, except that it's a childhood disease, so that sort of seems to point to something. 
I don't know. Childhood onset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, right. yeah. exactly right. Tough, tough deal. Dixon, you're next. Okay. Edward writes, Dear Vincent, just Vincent. This one's everybody turn off your sets. This is just for Vincent. <laughs> I've just listened to yourself and others and the other authors of Principles of Virology talking about this week's TWIV. It's a textbook I very much admire, and it was an, it was interesting to hear the pro- processes and the enormous amount of work that goes into writing it. In particular, I was very interested in the debates uh, you had about precision and clarity in scientific writing. Good scientific writing is a difficult skill to master, but in my experience, it is barely taught and rarely practiced. As a public slash educational service, I wonder if you and your colleagues would consider making a Principles of Virology style guide available. <laughs> it sounds as if you have already co- codified a lot of your discussions, and I'm sure I'm not the only person who would benefit from a virological strunk and white. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all your work you put into Principles of Virology and, of course, for the podcasts. Yours, illiterately, <laughs> Ed. <laughs> he comes from uh, UK, so he's got the King's English to back him up on his, uh, his uh, concerns. I read this to uh, my co-authors the other day. Kathy, you had a little addition to this. No, which is that this was regarding the TWIV 245. So, so does Jane want to write another book? <laughs> no. She laughed. She laughed. They all laughed. So I presume that's They all that. laughed, that's right. But I'm I'm taking notes as we go over the chapters and so maybe I don't know if it would be a book, but it might be a, an article or a blog blog post. So a yeah. pamphlet. I'll keep that in mind. Uh Alan, to what extent can scientific writing be taught or writing in general, and to what extent is it a gift? Um it can I, I think it can all be taught. Um I, I don't think this is some mystical mm-hmm. gift that's handed from on high. I, I think what happens is people get good at writing by doing it. Right. Okay. And, and by and having and it... Read, and reading, right? Get, yes, and reading. So the, the keys to good writing are to read good writing, um, attempt to do good writing, and get feedback from somebody who knows good writing mm-hmm. to improve it. And then lather, rinse, repeat. You continue that cycle... <laughs> Um, and the more you do this, uh, the better you will get. Right. The, um, the, the text for this, and everybody in the industry and everybody outside the industry agrees on this, I think, is Strunk and White, uh, The Elements <laughs> of Style. If you haven't read that and you want to improve your writing, then read that and your writing will improve. And if you're looking for something else to, to read about writing, read Strunk and White again. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it really, it's that, that whole philosophy... Yeah. does does an enormous amount to improve one's writing style. What, what was amazing for me, I mean, I served on the study section for a while, and I'm sure you all have too, and the way you judge uh, wonderful grants rather than just okay grants are the ones that just read so beautifully. Yeah. From the yeah, abstract all the way through to the materials and methods and the conclusions, it was just an absolute joy to read certain grants. And having said, I, I mean, I just said this can be taught, um, but... In a sense, it's a way of thinking. Right. And what happens is writing is so seldom taught well. Um, you know, the focus at the all the way through even the college level is just getting people to put facts on paper so you can test their knowledge. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's so seldom taught well that what we're left with is the naturally selected population of people who have taught themselves to write. And those people are writers. You know, that's that's what yeah, I did ever yeah. since I was a kid. I was fascinated with this process, and I worked on improving it. And so I had, I had been working on it for a long time. Um, but anybody, I think anybody with practice can at least become a better writer and, and probably become a really good one. Write every day. That's the deal. Write something every or just, day. Or just write frequently. I got a reply from Stephanie. Oh, cool. What's it? She says... Now, remember, this was the, uh, this was yeah. the norovirus, norovirus. Mm. continuous exposure thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Where to start? Brilliant ideas, and I do think there is something to the continual exposure inducing some level of protection. People shed virus for weeks after their symptoms resolve, so even if they are not persistently infected in the classical sense, they are surely seeing virus antigen, uh, seeing shedding virus antigen for prolonged periods, or seeing virus antigen for prolonged periods. The biggest problem with the questioner's idea is that noroviruses evolve so efficiently that presumably antigenically distinct strains arise frequently. So yes, the vaccine, vaccine formulation will have to be multivalent and frequently remodified. 
This is the hope with uh, VLP-based vaccines in clinical trials. The other issue of note is that we can't generate attenuated vaccine strains so because no cell culture system. That's my short answer, she says. Okay. So there you go. All right, the next one is from Andres, who writes, Hi, my name is Andre. I am from Colombia. I just want to say thanks for your lessons on Virology 1, how viruses work, your blog podcast, and especially for the transcript of them. I must admit that my writing, listening, English skills are not good, but thanks to your transcripts, I have been able to keep your classes at the same time that I improve my English. Thanks from Colombia. You are a really nice teacher, Mr. Rakaniello. <laughs> Thank you very much, Andres. Rich, you are next. Peter writes, massively enjoyed this. I am an ardent fan of principles. Uh, so he's talking about that same principles mm -hmm. of virology episode. I am an ardent fan, fan of principles of virology, which I use for everything I teach. It simply makes sense to me. Uh, just wish someone would do the same for immunology. <laughs> Your news that uh, POV 4th edition will be electronic is exciting news, but triggers a question. Are open licensing permissions, such as Creative Commons, likely to apply to POV images? In the good old days, two years ago, there were simple rules about what we could and couldn't do with the sheafs of paper from copyrighted sources we gave to students. For example, the 5% rule for copying for textbooks allowed me to use your images in student handouts. But online electronic teaching material is a whole new world where every single image has to be cleared before we're allowed to use it. So our teaching is likely to look very different in the future as we will be prevented from using any material that isn't compliant uh, by these strange new copyright rules. Just, real, just to really mess with your head, I'm told that if you've used a POV image in a TWIV podcast, <laughs> we can use it. As I said, weird. Uh, if you need any review of uh, HCV content in the new text, happy to help, which is a pathetically transparent attempt to get an early view of the good stuff. All the best. <laughs> Peter. Uh, Ooh, this is a very thorny <coughs> issue, as Alan will attest to. Oh, and yeah. In fact, when I, I gave a talk at Rochester earlier this year, and I was talking about online teaching, and someone asked me this very question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the answer, are open licensing permissions such as Creative Commons likely to apply to POV images? The answer is no. ASM is highly protective of its content. And in fact, I had to sign an agreement with ASM to use their image in the Coursera lectures. And I had to put on every slide, copyright 2009 ASM. And then at the end, I had to put a disclaimer saying... You may not reuse any of these images in anything that you do without the permission of ASM. Um, and so there are going to be different ways of approaching it, but that's ASM's approach. So what to do in the future? If you want to teach a course online and use images from POV, you'll probably have to get their permission. You can get a blanket permission from them, which is what I got, um, but you're going to have to do that. And... and just to, uh, people often, um, uh, especially on the internet, seem to take this stance that everything should be open and an organization that, uh, that puts stuff, you know, does all this on copyright and putting copyright on every slide, that's the bad way to go. Um, but there's a little bit of nuance here because if you are an organization like ASM and you say, well, okay, um, for now, we'll say this image can be used by anybody. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. If you ever let it out of copyright, mm -hmm. you yeah. can't pull it back. That's right. Uh, so I think, I think what a lot of organizations are doing, especially nonprofit organizations, is they're copywriting everything left and right and, and announcing that in every way they possibly can because nobody knows what any of this is worth in the future. And nobody knows, uh, you know, whether they're going to regret the decision to open it up. And I and I think probably over the next few years, as this evolves a bit more, you may see some more opening up of sources when that becomes a less risky choice. What a mess. So, Vincent, I have a, I have a question. Uh, we don't teach an online course, but we teach a course in which we use images from a variety of sources in our PowerPoint lectures and our PowerPoint 
notes then get posted to a password protected site that the students have access to. Mm -hmm. Do we have to get additional permission from ASM or the other sources to use the images in that context? No, since okay. it's used, you can use it for your course, and if it's on, uh, on a protected site, you don't have to get permission. You're allowed to use the images for teaching purposes. Okay. So you're fine. I should point out that um, the, the contract I signed with ASM, the textbook contract, states that I can use the images for anything I want, including online use. Yet, when uh, ASM learned that I was going to teach the Coursera course, they wanted me to sign an additional agreement, which I think I didn't have to do legally, but I don't mind maintaining good relations with my publisher. <laughs> right, yeah. It's very interesting. Keep tuned. I don't know about this. If we use an image in TWIV, we can use it. That's weird. I don't know where that Well, came. the TWIV blog is, um, uh, you've put that under a Creative Commons license. Yeah, but I doubt that ASM but would, I would doubt agree with that. that. that yeah, and I, doubt, I, I don't know that that subsumes yeah. material that you've used under license from other sources. Probably not. I, I have not used images very much. We do use it in the Virology 101. Right. Right. So... Technically, I should put a copyright on all of those, but I always forget. I'm sorry. Uh, Alan, you are next. <laughs> okay. James writes, Kia Ora, folks. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> uh, vaccines are a topic that pops up routinely on TWIV, and one thing I've wondered about is how can we test new vaccines for efficacy without actually exposing the person to the pathogen? It's a long time since Edward Jenner was exposing children to smallpox to show how to show cowpox worked as a vaccine. I couldn't see even the worst of ethics boards letting a researcher do that today. Uh, James is in Wellington, New Zealand. Uh, the The phrase you're looking for here is correlates of immunity. Right. Um, so vaccines. <laughs> The first trial that you do with one in humans after you've gotten through proving that it's that it's safe, you know, it's not killing the animals and it protects the animal, whatever animal model you use. Um, then you go into humans, uh, you do a small phase one trial to see uh, that it doesn't kill the humans. Um, and you also look for what you believe correlates with immunity. And with most traditional vaccines, that is, does, does this stimulate antibody production? So if you're testing if you're testing a vaccine and it stimulates antibody production, then you say, okay, it produces what we believe is immunity, and then you can move on to to try it in a population that you think will be exposed to the virus naturally. Yeah, and uh, ultimately, when you're doing uh, larger scale trials, it's an it's an epidemiologic issue. You know, right. you just look right. at the incidence of whatever disease you're trying to vaccinate for in that population. Yeah, and, and once you've if, once you've determined that it's safe. Um, and you move to you know a large enough sample size that you that you know this thing is safe. You can go with very large populations for your field trials because you're not really exposing those people to any additional risk. You're just giving them the vaccine that produces the antibodies or whatever other correlate of immunity, and seeing what protection rate you get. And that's like these HIV vaccine trials that you see. They'll they'll be vaccinating thousands and thousands of people who are at high risk for catching the disease, and then they see. Who does and who doesn't? I remember years ago uh, uh, attending a seminar by one of my uh, colleagues in Buffalo on the attempts to develop a gonorrhea vaccine. And he was testing these in the military. And I asked uh, sort of semi-facetiously, so when you test the vaccine, what do you do? Do you have some? Do you challenge these guys? Uh, and he said, "We don't have to. Right. The average soldier gets something like one to two doses a clap a year." Mm. Yeah. Yeah, you have to find an at-risk population for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that's uh, relevant to the HIV trials. Mm -hmm. Finding an appropriate at-risk at population so mm -hmm. that you can get good statistics is mm -hmm. is part of the challenge. But you have to counsel them. Yes, on, on not doing at-risk behavior. I don't know if they right. did that in the military, but um, it, with the HIV it trials, wouldn't do any good. <laughs> well, it's sta it's standard procedure in the military to counsel them on not doing risky behavior, but it doesn't stop <laughs> that, it. that gives you one to two uh, incidents a year. Now we probably have insulted a bunch of soldiers. Now we're going to get mail. No, it's funny that you tell them not to do risky behavior, but they jump out of helicopters, right? Right. <laughs> Yeah, there's a little bit of tension there, isn't there? <laughs> well, they're doing the one thing to allow them to do the other thing. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah. Kathy, you're next. 
Okay, Brian writes, Dear Vincent, Rich, Alan, Kathy, and Dixon, I thought the following paper would be of interest to the Twiverse, Signatures of Mutational Processes in Human Cancer, and he gives the link to that. It's published in 2013. The authors, uh, of which there are many, cataloged the somatic mutations occurring in over 7,000 human cancers of 30 different classes to sort out the mutational signatures arising from different mutational processes. Of interest to virologists, mutational signatures associated with Apobex were found in 16 cancer types with a prevalence of 16.6% in samples, see figure 3. The authors suggest that because ApoBec activation constitutes part of the innate immune response to viruses and retrotransposons, it may be these mutational signatures represent collateral damage on the human genome from a response originally directed at retrotransposing DNA elements or exogenous viruses. Although morbid, it's a pretty compelling idea that each of us play, pays a price, cancer, for surviving a lifetime of viral warfare. Mm. Sincere thanks for producing this podcast. Great job. So I think I didn't go look at this paper. Uh, we, we talked about a similar paper by Reuben Harris on TWIV232, the same similar oh, finding yeah. that you know, these Apobex are antiviral proteins. They deaminate cytosines, and they're particularly important for HIV, for example. They get packaged into the HIV particle and deaminate the genome. Of course, HIV counteracts it, so it gets around it, but... Um, Ruben Harris at the University of Minnesota also found that there's a lot of mutations in these proteins in cancer. So it's really interesting that, mm. you know, when you when you develop a tumor, you first start with a transformed cell that begins to replicate uncontrollably. Then it accumulates mutations. And the conventional wisdom is about a dozen mutations are needed to make it a tumor. And this one would it would cause even more mutations to occur. It's quite interesting. So it's a neat story. We might end up doing it one day because hmm. it is an antiviral protein. Hmm. This reminds me of the episode that we had with Pat Moore where he uh, introduced oh, yeah. the concept that there's uh, actually a lot of overlap between uh, oncogenes and uh, innate immunity genes, uh, both right. impinging on control of the cell cycle. So uh, it's not too much of a surprise that uh, the evolution of the antiviral response uh, and the evolution of oncogenesis are, you know, overlapping. All right. Should we do one more? Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, Dixon, you're, you're the wrap-up here. All right. Jason writes, good eye, TWIV team. I hope you're all well. I've held off giving my somewhat simplistic opinion on whether viruses are living for a while, but I thought, hey, why not put it in my two cents worth? I believe that the majority of viruses can be considered living. I view them as a seed that springs to life, in quotes, when undergoing replication in the host cell. But there are, of course, caveats. For me, a virus is an entire entity consisting of nucleic acid encapsulated in a protein coat with or without lipids. That's funny. That's my definition, too. But more importantly for me, to consider viruses a living <clears throat> is requirement that the nucleic acid encodes for proteins that do something that require energy. For example, enzymes that use ATP. Also, those enzymes must be able to be adapted to suit the host cell environment. In other words, they must evolve in response to change. This means that, for me, there are some viruses that don't conform to my view of what I consider to be living. This is why I could never give you a straight answer on your internet <laughs> poll. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Cheers, Jay. So the problem with my poll is that I say, are viruses living? But it really should be, are virus particles living? Right. And I've realized that as we've <coughs> discussed this oh, over well. the years in TWIV. The virion is not living, but as as Jay said, it's like a seed. It gets into a cell and it's living. So that is right. where, where my thought has evolved. So Jay just sort of just to see, give Jay a little credence here, he's not just an average listener. He's a virologist that's actually a senior medical research scientist. Yeah. Down so under. He's done a lot of thinking about uh, all of this stuff throughout his life, I'm sure. And um, yeah. that's a great email. It's very short and concise. Jay works on enteroviruses. Right. And he makes beautiful computer-generated images of polio, which he sends to me regularly. Oh, terrific. <laughs> <laughs> He's, uh, I'm going to go visit him next summer when I'm down under. Sounds good. Awesome. Now, well, is that summer, our summer, or their summer? It's their winter, our summer. <laughs> yeah, it's next July, unfortunately. <laughs> 
but I'm told it doesn't get really that cold down there. He's in Melbourne. Melbourne is a great city. Now, look at all these emails that are left. I know. I was just doing that. I wish we could well, do them all in one episode. You know, well, we got... Wait a second. I'm looking at the scroll bar. It looks like yeah, we're we kind of near, near the halfway point. So we just need to do all the email episodes a little more frequently. Or all emails next time. Yeah, we yeah. could do back-to-back. All right. Let's do some picks. Aha. Uh-huh. Vixen, do you have a pick? I do. Finally, I have a pick. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready for you here, Vincent. <laughs> I'm going to pick a book, which I will recommend to every listener as the book you should read just before you go to bed. This is a book at bedside that you can just just pick any chapter you want and just start reading it. And it's just the most beautifully written prose with regards to the natural environment that I can think of because it's the most beautiful book I've ever read. And it's called A Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. That's my pick. All right. Why? Why? Why is it good? Oh, well, you'll see when you start reading it. I mean, you talk about scientific writing. This guy um, was considered to be uh, the world's greatest wildlife uh, ecologist of his time. He and uh, John Muir and uh, Theodore Roosevelt established Yellowstone National Park as the first national park ever in the, in the world. <clears throat> and he began his career as a... Uh, was a bounty hunter for wolves in Arizona, so <laughs> he evolved rapidly to realize that if you disconnect any part of the natural ecosystem, you're going to have big consequences to pay for it. And so he devoted the rest of his life to managing wildlife rather than getting rid of wildlife. And so this relates very much to what's going on today, say, let's say in Yellowstone Park, where they've got reintroduced wolves. People don't like them. They shoot them all the time. This is a terrible situation. His book is the ethos for for resonating well with nature and, 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 and gives great reasons for wanting to preserve it. And he has a wonderful uh, um, <clears throat> uh, center that they've uh, designated in his honor in Wisconsin, where he grew up as a child, called the Shack. And at the Shack, if you go visit it, it's not just a shack, it's a family house on a former farm, and he watched the farm grow back to nature. That's the book. I, I highly recommend it. Okay. Great, great read. I just bought it on my Kindle. Okay, it's a great read. It's a great read. Thank and you. And has hey. anyone read it? <coughs> no. 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 Sounds good. Oh, okay. you'll love it. You'll love it. Rich, what do you have? Uh, this results from. This is a little on the edge here, but it comes <laughs> under these. It comes <laughs> under the science uh, section uh, of NPR, so I figure it's qualified. This results from a conversation that uh, you and I and a couple of others had in a bar at. Um, <laughs> the ASV meeting, uh, Vincent, uh, and it relates to the fact that in many locations now, but this started in the uh, airport in Amsterdam and uh, elsewhere, uh, you will find in the men's room engraved in the uh, porcelain in the urinal a fly. Yes. And uh, there are actually scientific studies that say <laughs> that if there's this fly there, oh, that it decreases the mess around the urinal by 80%. Yep. Okay. When were you and I talking about this, Rich? Oh, you don't remember that? that no. Was, that was it, uh, it was it that uh, it was raining, so we couldn't walk home. We went to a, a bar downstairs. Uh, How funny. Uh, and with uh, the guy who's um, Corey Mann from PLOS uh-huh. and Grant. Oh, I'm right, sure right. you were there. Yeah, we went in that basement bar in, yeah, uh, in uh, right. college state or whatever. And that came up and we had this discussion okay. and I uh, immediately looked it up <laughs> and it's been sitting there uh, on my iPhone as a link for cool. a long time. Cool, it's great. Time. I've never yes. seen that. Have you so the article, yes, I have. I've, no, yeah. I've never seen it. The article's pretty good and it goes into all sorts of different uh, techniques that can be used to train <laughs> uh, boys and men nice. uh, to sort of, you know, behave themselves. To yeah. aim. Yeah, they do. Hey. They do make a mess. I have to agree. Yeah, <laughs> apparently the fly works great. Uh, maybe That's I should paint one on my <clears throat> toilets at home. As one fly to another, she's got to get a sticker. <laughs> a sticker, yeah. Kathy, what I, you... I, I was trained with a moving target. My father, <laughs> my father was a smoker. Oh and dear. So uh, uh, cigar- cigarette butts. Uh, oh, this is this is really gross. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you were good, you could cause the center- cigarette butt to disintegrate. Kathy. <laughs> I know nothing about any Two, of that three, stuff, four, but and seriously. I'm going to take us into loftier things I hope with so. my pick, which is a specific 
astronomy picture of the day. I ah. picked the whole site in the past, but this particular one on August 19th has a video that's just beautiful with noctilucent clouds and an aurora over Scotland. Mm. And uh, both of those things are kind of rare events, and the, they both happened on one day. And this uh, person caught it on film, and I just highly recommend you go watch it. Fantastic. It's beautiful. So I didn't understand. Yeah. Wh- I watched this, and it's, it is very beautiful. I didn't understand. Can you define Noctilucent Cloud for me? Uh-huh. Uh, you just have to click on any of the links down below where it says Noctilucent Clouds. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Oh, well, the first one, I guess, ah, rats, takes you to a YouTube, sorry. <laughs> Usually they take you to something like a Wikipedia oh, here link. we go. Uh, yeah, there's a Wikipedia entry. I'll <laughs> check yeah. that out. Okay. So, Alan, what do you have? Uh, I have a pick that is uh, somewhat related to a couple of letters from this episode. Um, it is. It was just released, I think it was just released today, um, a flu vaccination map. This is a map of um, flu vaccine coverage rates across the U.S. And the way um, this from the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the way they're tracking this is they're looking at um, Medicare claims data. Hmm. So this is this is really only people who are on Medicare. Um, so uh, senior citizens, um, no offense, Dixon. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but that's a very relevant population, a good indicator population to look at. And you can click on any state in this map. So they're looking at percentage of total Medicare uh, recipients who have claimed for flu vaccination hmm. yeah. as a way of traffic tracking flu vaccination rates because they have those data. Uh, and it's obviously very easy to anonymize. You just release the statistical data and they have it all broken down uh, to the county level. And at the county level, you can click there, and they'll break it up within your county. Yes, hmm. it's amazing. Yeah, you can look at you can look at subset. You can go down to town, um, and and get these okay. uh, vaccination rates. Now, it's cool. it, they seem a little high to me for this time of year, but maybe that's I don't know if they're currently posting last year's data or if um, that really is. I mean, we've got. Uh, let's see, my town, we've, we're looking at 65% coverage. It is. If you look down just below the map, there's a thing where you can choose 2012, 2013, which comes up by default, or you can go to this year. Right. And I think refresh and then get something else. Okay, so 2012, 2013 is... Yeah, there much, we go. Much 2013, redder. <laughs> that, was, that was the issue. Yes, right, okay. So the highest states are... Massachusetts, Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's your uh, TWIV bump there, Alan. There we go. Cool. That's neat. I wish they had it for everyone, though. But that, that's a good way to monitor it, I guess. Yeah, they, they've got to work with the data they have. Yep. So. Yep. And since not everybody has health insurance, you can't easily. <clears throat> Dixon, did you get your flu shot? Uh, not yet. Are you going to? Yep. Why don't we go together? We could film it. <laughs> That'd be good. I could film you. I don't want It'd be a picture for a Twitter episode. Nice, That's exactly it? right. Arm in arm. My pick is a very geeky pick. Uh-huh. It is the Picornavirus homepage. Picornaviride.com. Yes, there is a domain name. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> this of course is, there uh, is. This is run by Nick Knowles, who is a virologist over in the UK. Good Lord. He's been doing this for years, and I... I always look at this. It's a great reference. It lists all the current genera. And as new viruses pop up, he uh, puts them here. And he's got a little interesting information on each one. And, uh, you know, in September, rhinoviruses are 60 years old. Are they? Well, the discovery. Discovery. Of uh, yeah, yes. I would they qualify aren't that six, one. They are probably much older. <laughs> anyway, it's a, cool, it's a cool resource. And any wow, this, given this rhinovirus is, is much younger. Yeah. So you can this, click is on, a, this is a lot of work. You can click yeah. on any of the ent, on any of the genera at the left, and it expands. It tells you all the species and so forth, and gives you references. Ooh, he's, got, he's got cool 3D structures. Yeah, it's a great site, Nick Knowles, and I doubt many people know about it, but now they will. They're going to get a twiv bump, Nick. We do have a listener pick from Peter, who writes, "Thanks for maintaining the TWIV site. It's an excellent resource. I'm not sure if you have seen PDB 101, the educational portion of the 
PDB website. For example, here is a new paper model for the HIV capsid. We also have a couple of flyers about viruses on this page, and it gives links. I thought it might be an interest for your audience. Peter is the scientific lead at the Protein Data Bank, which is maintained at UCSD. So there you go. I had no idea that you were listening, Peter. <laughs> so thank you, and give give the <laughs> PDB a twiv bump. And it is a really cool site. If you go to it, um, there's a molecule of the month right. that they've gathered together, and you scroll down on that page, they have a whole list of uh, viruses. That's one way that I found the viruses. Yeah, the PDB the is just cool. They have beautiful structures there, and then yeah. that molecule of the month is great. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think David Goodsell draws those, or draws a lot of them. He's an artist at Scripps who likes to draw molecules. All right, that is our all-email episode, which you'll be able to find, of course, at twiv.tv and also at iTunes. And even though we have lots of questions left, keep sending them in to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon de Palmier is at verticalfarm.com. Did I wake you up? Trichinella.org and medicalecology.com. Thanks for joining us, Dixon. My pleasure. Are you going fishing this weekend? You bet. Ah. Absolutely. Good luck. Thank you. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was a lot of fun. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Quite welcome. Always a good time. And Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com and also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Rackenyellow, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>